So we're showing us live here, and we'll just check on LinkedIn whether or not we are live. If you're seeing us on LinkedIn, if you pop into the comments, say hello. Hope you're all doing okay. This is our usual awkward beginning part where no one knows if you're live and we don't know if there's anyone here. Who <laughs> knows? If you're here, say hello. Tell us we are. Ah, uh, there we go. I just got it. Aha, I see it as well now. Oh, yeah, look. There we are. We're <laughs> live. Likewise. Oh, we're out of focus. Hey, everyone. That's people coming in. We've got seven people. Eight. Hello, Mr. Eight who, or Mrs. Eight, whoever that was. If you're just dr dropping in, say hello. Let us know where you are in the comments below. We'll get started in just a minute once there's a few people. Hi, Kim. Welcome. Hey, Kim. Hey there. Good afternoon or good evening. When does evening start? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> oh, Susie's again. Hi, Susie. Nice to see you from the Isle of Man again. Good to have Hi, you. Susie. Welcome. There we are. Hello. Here we go. Yay. Oh. Hello from burning London. London. How warm is London? Tell us. It's pretty Super hot up here hot. as well. But let's not complain. We like we like the sun. Yes. Glasgow's Hello, in the Glasgow. room. Hi, Stuart. Welcome. <laughs> Sultry Glasgow. Sultry Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> no matter what the weather. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait a wee second, let everyone join us that's joining. Hello, Jenny Plant. How are you? Nice to see your face. It's too hot too in London. Too hot. I get it. I get it. Yeah, you're not getting much sympathy here. No. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's not burning, you know. At most, nope. it's like the rain has turned warmer. So <laughs> that'll do me. Wet, Wet. Grief and it's raining in grief. Surely not. That sounds awesome, though. It's we are spanning the globe. <laughs> <laughs> We're in three points of <laughs> the UK. <laughs> Cool. We'll get started. Brilliant. Well, will we kick off then? Go for it, Rachel. Well, it's so lovely to see you all. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm Rachel Brown and I'm from the Creative Entrepreneurs Club. And the aim of these sessions is we hope just to give you a bit of inspiration, some insight and normally some sun on a sunny day. But clearly we've all got far too much sun going on in our lives at the moment. This is a pretty blistering 45 minutes and I'm delighted that we've got Brian with us today who's going to talk about all things games and then some. We're just going to see how it flows. But for those of you who have never joined us before, we will finish bang on 5.45 and myself and Andrew Doby will do a bit of a double act, ask Brian some questions. Keenan, who you can see, holds us all together. So please do put some um, that way, we, whichever way we are, we're all on different points of the screen. That way, Kieran's there. There's Kieran. Um, <laughs> he will be holding us all together. Uh, so please do put some questions in the chat if you want to ask Brian anything, or if you want to indeed ask any one of us anything. Not that Keenan, um, Andrew, and I know anything about games or gamification. Or maybe no, just a wee. Oh, good. Yeah. This is going to be a good <laughs> Yeah, we'll just all jump in. It's a free for all. But the way that this happens, I'm just going to introduce Andrew Doby, who's going to give a bit of a context for this. But the part of this uh, that is exciting is that the Creative Entrepreneurs Club has been working alongside a whole bunch of industry partners, made brave included, for the last couple of months now um, under our COVID banner and I'm thrilled that we've almost got 1700 members in the club um, which has been an increase of 1400 since um, March the 13th the Friday the 13th when Andrea and I and several others kicked off our new way of working together so um, thank you so much for all of you that are joining us and if you're not joining us jump on over to Creative Entrepreneurs Club tell us what you need tell us what you want and the, similarly in the LinkedIn group there's a COVID industry a COVID-19 creative industry um, group that Keenan 
up there mm-hmm. as part helps to galvanize and gather and there's people sharing jobs there's people sharing opportunities so we hope that we're playing a small part in keeping us moving forward in what has been most bonkers time i think we've all had the the privilege and not privilege to live through so that's just my small bit i'll come back and introduce brian in just a moment but andrew dobie is that way so i'll just pass you over to andrew (laughs) Thanks everyone. Thanks Rachel and hello everyone. Uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us again. Um, so yeah, as, as Rachel says, if you jump on over to the creativeentrepreneursclub.co.uk, um, we've worked with Rachel over the last few months and Rachel and her team have got all sorts of fantastic things to help you. Um, if you're struggling at the moment, so we built out a job board over there um, where people are promoting um, jobs and um, vacancies at the moment. So make sure if you're looking for work, uh, head over there or if you have a job, um, please head over there and put them up. Up. There's also one-to-one support with myself, uh, with Keenan, with Brian, with Rachel, and a whole host of other people where you can just pick at our brains if you just need a wee bit of a helping hand just now and struggling where to turn to next. We can't promise we'll help you. We'll try our very best. And if we can't, we'll point you in the direction of someone much more intelligent than us, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and as Rachel mentioned, we also have on here, if you just pop up onto your search bar and you type in creative industry COVID support group. We've got about three and a half thousand people that have joined a group on there and they're all helping each other out during COVID, trying to help each other um, again with work, with jobs, with a bit of morale um, and just a place to kind of find information on grants and loans as they appear as well. So, you know, don't struggle alone, join in and um, if we can all help, we surely will. So previous to this series, we've interviewing a lot of business experts um, to get some practical advice um, for for freelancers, for people who are running businesses at this time. You can check out a lot of those previous episodes again on the creativeentrepreneursclub.co.uk website or if you jump on to the Made Brave YouTube. So just jump onto YouTube, search Made Brave, you'll find those on there. Um, And as Rachel also mentioned, um, this series that we're now running, we're we're just trying to bring on some inspiring minds um, from different parts of the creative sector to inspire inspire us and to hopefully inspire you. So even even we need inspiring at this time. Um, it's been pretty challenging for everyone involved. So, um, you know, these are little uh, jolt of energy um, in the week for us, um, but hopefully they also are for you guys as well. Um, and, you know, creativity is really important to us at Made Brave. Our business is, around, is built around creativity and our purpose here, um, we often talk about, is to inspire creativity in others so they can bring their best ideas to life. Um, and, you know, with creativity being really important at the moment because of all the challenges we face, um, you know, and our last session, um, we sat down with Jay Lafferty, who is a stand-up comic, writer and producer. If you're interested in looking at that episode again, go and check out um, on the Made Brave channel on, on, over on the Creative Entrepreneurs Club site. Uh, Jay talked about her creative process um, as a com- um comedian i couldn't get that out there Um, and we and we also talked about her production company watch this space which supports emerging writers and performance from the scottish comedy community um so yeah go check those out and back to you rachel okay so for those of you just joining us we're doing a quick interview with brian now brian i always get your second name wrong badlow 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 it feels like a kind of word low (laughs) <laughs> That's as simple as that. Baglo. I, I would do the hyphen, but Baglo. I just don't think I'm pushing it. Baglo. So, here we well, Brian's joining us. And for those of you who don't know Brian, Brian is a gamification consultant, a growth hacker, and a narrative designer who's worked in the global games industry since games came in boxes from shops. An expert in Scotland's interactive industry, Brian has worked with a range of pioneering digital companies, including DMA Game, DMA Design, sorry, Rockstar Games, Digital Bridges, and Team Rock, as well as global startups and scale-up organisations. And so, as well as making games, Brian is a former technology journalist and editor, and he's also a lecturer on digital evolution and entrepreneurship at Edinburgh Napier University. He is the founder and director of the Scottish Games Network, which is where we first met each other. And it's dedicated to an interactive entertainment and games industry in Scotland. And there's some really cool stuff going on that we're gonna get into. So Brian specializes in helping creative organizations understand and make better use of games and interactive tools, technologies, and techniques to transform every aspect of their business. And apparently in his spare time, he sometimes also plays games. 
Okay, <laughs> nice rate. Well, you know, nice. spare time, I remember <laughs> that. Great, Brian. What is that? Can you tell us about spare time, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's something that happens to other people, Andrew. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm to figure that one out. Volunteering for things because they've got so much spare time on their hands. It's <laughs> madness. I don't understand it. Well, you know, Brian, to me, you know, I'm also a huge fan of gaming. And, you know, I think there's there's still a certain stigma around gaming in certain mm -hmm. circles that, you know, sometimes people, um, you know, they can be viewed as a waste of time or only for kids. And, you know, I think, you know, I'm one of the generation, you know, that grew up with gaming and still game just now. And I think there's a huge, it has a huge place, in, especially in my life anyway, for kind of sometimes a bit of escapism to get away from the kind of busy day to day, but also... I suppose you know um, there's kind of problem solving there there's a lot of creativity and it kind of um you know it can help you uh, in many ways um i mean recently we we're all talking earlier we've got all of us here i think have children going back to school tomorrow and um, my son finley he's nine years old just turned nine and um he's he's done nothing this, this since covid uh, since play but uh, play fortnight um but i think you know um I, first, I suppose first of all you know as parents you're sometimes worried about that but then I started realizing very quickly that, that this is how they, they, they socialize in terms of, you know, Fortnite, you know, your own group chat with your friends. And that was where they were hanging out because they weren't able to hang out earlier. So, I mean, there's all sorts of, of benefits to gaming and in the likes of playing Minecraft together that gives us all another creative outlet that, um, you know, that a creative outlet together. And, you know, and it doesn't, creativity doesn't, as you know, doesn't have to live and breathe on paper. When we're drawing, we can be building things in a 3D environment. So, um, you know, um, you know, we're really pleased to have you here. I suppose maybe to kick us off, would you, you know, tell us a little bit about how you got into gaming and where your, where your journey into gaming began? Sure. Um, oh, God. <laughs> that's, that's going back a little bit. Yeah, okay. So my first computer was a ZX81, the first publicly available, uh, you know, home computer um, that came ready built. And my parents fell for the colossal lie that Clive Sinclair perpetrated on that generation, which is computers are the future. They will help your children. Um, and of course, this was pre-Wikipedia. So that was complete horseshit. Yeah, there was nothing there that was going to help you. But you got the thing at home and then all, all of a sudden you discovered that the only thing you could really do with it Mum wasn't storing her recipes on it. Dad wasn't doing the accounts. But you could play games after a 12 to 15 minute loading time from a cassette player. Um, and then you could watch, you know, tiny blocky characters moving around the screen. Um, and I was entranced and captivated. And uh, that was my introduction to gaming. So way, way, way back. And the, the old Atari VCS, you know, the first home computer that really came with um, cartridges. So all of a sudden it opened up the entire market for gifting. So Granny could suddenly buy you Pitfall, or you know my my generation's uh, version of Tomb Raider, Pitfall Harry, uh, back in 1982. But a year I after I was born, Brian. <laughs> you look so young. <laughs> I did. You look young, young. Oh, COVID, hey. COVID is starting to age me. <laughs> you it rough. Tuesday, so, you know, I I'd like to think I'm still hanging together. You know, at least I've got hair. So. We'll, uh, we'll leave so, so how old were you then then with your first 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 gaming experience to give us an idea so, say say again sorry how, how old were you when you, you got your I, um, I was about 11 or 12. 11 i was 12. about 11 or 12 okay. and this was this was the era where computers were really just being introduced you know um i remember my first computer class at high school and uh none of the computers worked they were all zx81s um and it was because they had got the woodworking teacher to come and build little wooden frames around them so that people couldn't steal them and he had actually built them so well that they didn't have room for the power supply. Um, and it, none of the teachers could figure out why they weren't working. It was me going, you can't plug it in. Um, so we're talking like the really, really early days. You know, this was this was time out of mind, um, practically prehistoric. But I actually joined the industry uh, back in 1994. I joined the legendary um, Dundee studio DMA Design. So they were yep. the company that were, was behind Lemmings, which was one of the first oh, sort of real global superstar smashes. And that kind of gave them enough money, enough credibility to go out and start pitching their own ideas. And so I applied as a, as a programmer. I was yep. at Napier University. Um, I suck as a programmer. That's why I have never programmed anything ever since. Um, and I got shot down in flames very quickly. So. I applied six months later and sent them a CV, which I swear was an inch thick. And I claimed that I had discovered Greenland, written everything that Mozart took credit for, um, had invented time travel, you know, discovered three noble gases, just made stuff up. 
and, and they offered me a job as a writer. <laughs> and I think possibly because they were so scared they thought I might burn the office down if they didn't. Uh, so I started as a, as a writer um, on a, a really obscure, weird game that they didn't think was going to work. And it was a little top-down game where you drove around a city and you played a policeman and you had to arrest the bad guys. Um, and it was awful. Uh, and after about five months of infighting and design meetings and more fighting, we decided to let you play the bad guy and uh, change the name from Race and Chase to Grand Theft Auto. And um, that, that's that gone on to do quite well, I believe. It's done all right, I think. I think it's... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Admittedly, you know, it only went megastrophic after I left the company. So, you know, I'm not sure there's any, you know... Uh, cause and effect there but yeah, i think uh, everyone forgets that original version of grand theft auto don't they the the kind of top down version that's because it was so long ago andrew in november 97 <laughs> it came out is that what it was when, is when it? you were about four or five i imagine <laughs> what was that 97 16 16 i don't mean <laughs> I, 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 I remember it very well excellent that's well as long as you were over the age of 18 i wouldn't want to have to call the police on your parents Oh, yeah, sorry. I mean, eighteen. Yeah, yeah. I was eighteen. <laughs> yeah, and so, so that was really me. It was. I'm. Um, I'm a smash hit when I go and talk for your Creative Edinburgh or some of the big creative industries organisations, and they say, "How did you get started?" And I was like, well, "I lied through my teeth." Um, I'm not recommending it for everyone, and the industry has come on since those days. So, you know, you're far better to go and do one of the games degree courses rather than just make shit up. But uh, what can I say? It worked for me, and uh, I've been getting away with it ever since. <laughs> so tell us then about the, the profile of the gaming industry in Scotland, because we've all got a romantic view. Everybody can quote stuff from Dundee and, and talk about this big gaming industry. Do, do, but do we actually have it in Scotland? What is the profile? We, we, we do and we don't. We've got a couple of outliers. So we've got Rockstar North, who are still the, the driving force behind Grand Theft Auto, although it is now made on a global basis with every Rockstar office in the world contributing. And they're by far the biggest. You know, they've got 300 plus. Um, people at, at the peak of production. We've got 4G Studios who are doing um, Minecraft, all the console versions of Minecraft, and doing phenomenally well at that. We've got companies like um, Outplay and Tag and Cobra across uh, Dundee who are doing mobile and online and casual and social gaming. So we do have quite a, a thriving sector, but um, where we're at at the moment is we're, we're in kind of a, a strange place because the game sector doesn't really see itself as part of the tech scene, and it doesn't really see itself as part of the creative industries. It's mm -hmm. it's always been somewhat insular. You know, yeah. we, we like to think that we're a cross between Walton's Mountain and, you know, the, the polar base from John Carpenter's The Thing. Um, <laughs> we're alone and special, and, you know, we're, it, we're all Kurt Russell. <laughs> but we're not seeing startups coming from I wish. You know, oh, hey, listen, just believe you me, I'll take you to a couple of things. So I'm a little bit worried about it at the moment because uh, we've got six universities producing games graduates okay. and we've got pretty much every college in the country now doing HNCs and HNDs and game development. Um, but we're not getting the same startups coming through as we are in sort of the wider tech, fintech, you know, a lot of the, the wider software scene. Um, and so our cur cultural currency, the Grand Theft Autos and Lemmings, is becoming a cultural legacy you know mm. if you can name me three games that came out of scotland in the last two years i will send a crisp five pound note to your the charity of your choice sorry andrew i would have sent it to you directly but you know <laughs> um anyone exactly so you know we're not celebrating what we've got red dead not come out of here though a, a rock star no red dead redemption red, red dead, dead redemption 2 yes it did uh, it's mm. they were certainly involved um, possibly not the lead studio, but um, yeah, no, they were they were there. You've only got another two to go, and we've only got twenty five minutes. So I'll draw a line under that. But um, we've got a really active and vibrant game sector, but we're not quite getting the commercial and cultural successes I would like to see, or I think anyone would like to see. Um, so I'm I'm trying to drag the industry kicking and screaming into the future right now with a couple of different initiatives. Um, really just to try and, and, and sort of plug us in to the, to the rest of the creative world. Yeah. Because for me, one of the big, big opportunities um, coming up is applied gaming, which is taking mm -hmm. the tools and techniques from gaming and applying it outside, outside. mere entertainment. Um, you know, COVID has shown that we have to find new ways to work, new ways to meet, new ways to play, new ways to learn. 
And I think games can and should be at the heart of that. Okay. And can you tell us a bit more about that and the work you've been doing in that, Brian? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so um, a few years ago, if you've been working in marketing, advertising, or the creative industries, you'll have come across uh, a word which has become anathema, which was gamification, mm -hmm. which was essentially um, using games, tools, technologies, and techniques to go and um, create entirely new ways of building engagement. Mm -hmm. And it kind of got um, taken over by marketing companies. And because gamification can be quite difficult and complicated and it's intrinsic and extrinsic um, uh, you know um, incentivization all of this kind of thing so what they decided to do was just slap badges and leaderboards on any old shit and yeah. call it gamification so it kind of devalued the whole thing and all of a sudden the games industry is not interested in gamification because it's not real gaming the rest of the world's not interested because you know getting badges for going in and doing things like you know shopping at Tesco or donating blood this just seems to devalue certain things, you know, so you're not feeling as though you're contributing, you're not feeling as though you're being engaged on a personal level. It's like, hey, you bought our brand of tile grout, have a badge. You know, it just doesn't work. So applied games is kind of burying gamification under the carpet a little bit and actually taking it forward based on actual academic understanding and practical research into the ways that people respond to gaming. There is a reason that kids adore Fortnite and Minecraft and, you know, the opportunities to engage with each other in different ways. Taking that amount of attention, that amount of learning and applying it in different ways could absolutely revolutionize education. You know, instead of teaching kids the same way that we have since the 1700s, albeit without the leather belts and the squeaky chalk. Mm. Yeah. Now, if, if we come back to education in a minute, but there's just something you kind of mentioned there on kind of the gamification side that I don't know whether it, it makes me sad or kind of sometimes, I'm, you know, I'm watching Finn on his iPad and, you know, he comes up every every few minutes asking me to buy V-Box or asking me to buy something else, some, you know, some sort of currency in every single game. Uh -huh. And, you know, to me, it almost feels like the balance has gone the wrong way now that, that everything in these games is to gamify and to kind of try and you know, make people buy. And it's, it's kind of, now I get, we have to, these companies have to be commercially viable because, you know, they've got to play their their, their team, their, their selves. Um, but it almost feels like the balance is almost too much into that gamification way where, you know, every game now is free on the iPad pretty much as far as you, you know, as you can see, but they, they'll get hundreds of pounds out of you over, you know, the next however many months and years. And the kids are almost, you know, he's sitting watching, forced into watching these adverts so that he can get something virtual mm -hmm. and the hope that he gets enough of it that I'll top it up with something else. And, you know, I, I don't know, I'm just interested, but, you know, this is your world. And do, do you think it's shifted too far that direction now and we've absolutely, lost? Absolutely. And please don't mistake any of that for gamification. What you're talking about is is free to play and business models that, that mm -hmm. um, have really come into existence since the App Store was launched. Right, so 2008, June 2008, um, Apple launched the App Store and it utterly disrupted the game sector. So instead of having to have a huge team, massive amounts of upfront investment and it, making games for dedicated devices, all of a sudden you were making games. Two guys in a back bedroom in Dundee could produce something and put it out on the same platform as EA, Activision, Infocom, you know, the, the Infograms, the rest of the, the big games companies. But the, the business model itself, the whole free-to-play thing has been... You know, it's already been parodied by South Park. So if you want more background on that, folks, go and watch the South Park episode. Um, yes, it can be used very badly. It can be exploited. And there are companies out there who have utterly, shamelessly plowed this into the ground. So they nickel and dime players for moves in a game. You know, horse armor is a, a classic sort of game industry name. Um, you can't knock the, the business model, but it can be implemented yeah. in ways which are not exploitative. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a whole debate going on at the moment because Microsoft, as in the last 48 hours, Microsoft have just had their um, X Cloud, you know, cloud gaming platform declined by Apple because Apple are quite happy with their 30%, thanks very much. And, you know, the fact that the, uh, the vast majority of the games on the App Store are free to play and, you know, you get all of these microtransactions. Um, we can lay an awful lot of that, not everything, but a lot of that at Apple's feet. And all of a sudden, the games industry is going, hang on a minute, you know, is this actually where we want to be? Um, but it's got so bad, and the industry has 
been policing itself so poorly that we've now got the House of Lords and the House of Commons looking at issues like loot boxes and saying we should just classify these as gambling because that's what they are. So okay. unless the industry really pulls its finger out and addresses this in a quite proactive and aggressive way, it's we're going to be legislated against and all of a sudden that'll go away to a certain extent because we're going to be, you know, seen alongside the Bet Freds and the William Hills and the Paddy mm -hmm. Powers. Yeah. And I don't mm -hmm. think anybody in the, the video game sector wants that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of good parent, questions. Yeah, you know, yeah totally. And I think there's a couple of um, good questions that have come up um, that uh, our good friend Jessica has been has been on. And um, hey, so this is about um, inclusion in gaming, what it looks like in Scotland. Have you any sight over that? When I mean, you're talking about something that could be really progressive, Brian, so it'd be great to think that Scotland could be at the forefront of many things, mm -hmm. um, including being key in, in gaming. So uh, gaming and the inclusion in the games industry is a global issue, and it's something that we've struggled with for years. And it goes back, it's a legacy issue, because back, whoops, <clears throat> I totally had my phone switched off, I promise. Um, it goes back to the point where we were dealing with consoles. If you wanted to make a game, it was on a console. Um, and it was very sort of genre-driven. It was, you know, runny, jumpy, shooty, explodey. If you want something blown up on a planet, in space, on a mine, you come to the games industry. Explosions and blood, we do. Jump scares, we do. Um, and it attracted a lot of male developers. That is changing because, as Andrew said earlier, you know, there's a whole generation now who have grown up with gaming, but it's still an issue. We have actually, we're doing not too badly in games in terms of the applications to uh, the universities, but there's still gender split between um, programming and art, between the creative and technical side of things. Again, it's changing. But this goes back to the schools, you know, it goes back to primary school, high school. We absolutely need to address this. Um, but one of the things that's happening in the UK as a whole is we've got uh, UK, which is the UK wide industry organisation. They've got a, a, a programme called Raise the Game. And essentially you pledge to go and proactively work to make the games industry a more welcoming, inclusive and diverse place. Um, and I've signed the Scottish Games Network up for that, and I'm pushing pretty much every company, every organisation, everyone that I ever have a Zoom call with to sign and pledge as well, because it's really, really important. Where can um, we read more about that, Brian? What's, the, what's that called again? Raisethegame.com. Raise. Um, and it's a fantastic initiative, and I would recommend anybody who's interested in the, the issue of diversity within the game sector to, to really go and uh, start looking at that. Um, because... If you go back just a few years, 2015 and 16, the games industry was a hideous, horrible, nasty, toxic place. We had this, this um, movement called Gamergate, and it was essentially the, 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 um, the emergence of the alt-right, you know, with all of the online trolling, all of the online abuse, bullying, harassment, you know, doxing, the release of people's personal information online, was pioneered in the game sector. It was atrocious. Um, and the industry as a whole, the big, you know, the, the, the bigger companies, the pioneers, didn't really come out against it in the way that you would expect. You know, um, as part of the, the head of the Scottish Games Network, I wrote a post saying Scotland says no, everyone is welcome here, everyone is well, you know, we will be a fair and tolerant and, and, and welcoming place for every participant, whether they're studying, making, writing about games. Um, I got death threats. You know, admittedly, one of them was a 14-year-old in Iowa, so I sent it to his mum. But um, it's not really the sort of thing you would expect for saying, hey, how about we all actually show a little, you know, support and human decency? Yeah. Um, and that never ended. It just kind of tailed off. And right. so my worry is that it's still out there kind of lurking. Um, I mean, I don't know. Have you guys ever come across the, the, the term swatting? No, I've not heard that. Oh, excellent. So swatting is basically when you make an emergency call to the police force in the US, primarily, and say, oh my God, there's an armed madman in this house. I just saw him running with a gun. And the SWAT team comes around, kicks their way in, and some poor guy who's gaming, writing about games, developing games, has an armed response team in his house. People have died because of this. Yeah. Um, so gaming can be a place of hideous 
privilege and, and real um, toxicity. So I'm trying my very best to sort of make a stand against it. And I, and I think we're making huge progress. The fact that we've got but, six uh, universities in this country doing this. Brian, I mean, that's just as brilliant to hear. And I know that certainly from our perspective, all of us on this call, I'm sure everybody that's tuning mm -hmm. into LinkedIn Live will do everything you know that we could to support and, and be part of that movement forward because we're at such a crucial time. That, yeah. that well, actually, I'm not seeing any death threats in the comments, so your head and shoulders are above the <laughs> But I think, you know, I'm so pleased to see that the Scottish Given Network signed up for that straight away and, and um, you know, the, the, the kind of nation, if we're talking about building back better and, and what we want to see as a society and the nation that we're in, mm -hmm. I think, you know, we've all got our part to play in that. And I wasn't actually, I'm not a gamer, and thank you, Jessica, for bringing that up, you know, I, it wasn't something that was I was aware of. So it's now on my awareness, I've written it down. And uh, raisegame.com on it. Thanks, Jess, for that. And Zante as well was um, keen to hear the, the response. Um, kind of moving on, there's some really exciting things that you kind of touched on. But I'm really mm -hmm. curious as to what your um, day, day to day has been like in COVID. Because I imagine like everybody who is into uh, games and in this industry has just been happy days that you're sitting bunkered down. Uh, in, a, in your house, not having to go anywhere and be part of it. And that is a sweeping generalisation. <laughs> but what is your day yeah. look like? Because you're up to something pretty special. Um, well, you know what? This is one of those, um, this is one of those sort of uh, fantasies that everybody has about the games industry. Um, <laughs> they seem to think a little bit like Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. Uh, you know, you get a job, you wander in sort of mid-morning, you have a game of pinball, you get a free coke out the machine, you sit down, you do a little light programming, and then you play games. Um, <laughs> not really like that. Don't ruin uh, it for us. Don't ruin it, Brian. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. You asked me on, Andrew, so you're getting the plain unvarnished truth. Uh, I'm sorry. But uh, gaming is a, a creative industry like everything else. Um, and because it's digital, it's a lot more like software than the games industry really wants to admit to. Um, yes, you do get to play games, but it can be tough. Again, you know, the game sector is populated by a lot of people who are hugely, hugely passionate about what they do. They have made a decision to get into the games industry because they want to make games. Um, and this passion has been turned against them in some cases. So there's a a term that's used widely in the game sector, a, a few people outside of Saturn here, called crunch, which is essentially uh, you work until you're dead um, or you've got a deadline coming up. So you'll end up working 12, 14, 18 hour days, sleeping under your desk in order to hit the deadline to get the demo made for the big game shoot, you know, the big event or to get the release date um, that you you planned 18 months beforehand. Um, if you want to look at the, the a recent example, Red Dead Redemption 2, you mentioned, Andrew, uh, one of the directors at Rockstar went on record quite proudly saying, yeah, we've been pulling 100 hour weeks mm -hmm. as though that's something to be proud of rather than going, wow, your planning and managers and producers must be absolutely appalling. Um, so, you know, it, it can be it can be really tough. But I think what the whole lockdown has shown is that uh, you can actually have people working remotely. You can actually have people uh, producing creative content in a way which the games industry was never really willing to explore and experiment with. Mm -hmm. You know, so my own day, I, I, I tend to be the social butterfly. I've kind of become the biz guy in the game sector. So I've not made games as such for, for the last few years. But um, I, you know, get up at six, plan the, the posts for the Scottish Games Network, do some research into what's happening out there in the industry, um, respond to emails. Uh, I'm planning my own series of live streams, just like this one, but, you know, more gamesy. Um, but tracking down anybody in the games industry who's willing to appear on camera it, 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 it is astonishingly hard. Um, you know, there are people that I've known for years, and I feel like I might have to go and kidnap one of their parents um, in order to make them come and talk to me on camera. Um, and I'm a social butterfly. I do lots of meetings. I, you know, I, I'm a hyper-connector. Um, so my caffeine consumption has dropped vastly because I'm not in around coffee shops and hotel bars and everything on a on a daily basis. Um, 
But, you know, it's like working remotely is something that I've done and a lot of people in the game sector have done for years now. So it's been almost business as normal. Um, but, you know, people have embraced Zoom and, and embraced uh, Google Hangouts and meetings in a way that I never believed possible. I, you know, the last time I had a phone call, it was somebody inquiring about a, a car accident I'd had five years ago. Hey. And I talked to the poor guy for about 10 minutes and wouldn't let him off. And so, you know, it, it, it's not vastly different. Um, yeah. It, for me, I, I've freelanced for years and years. But I think for a lot of the, the larger companies, they've they've had to pivot fairly quickly. But since Agile is such a, a sort of a, a go-to for the games industry, I don't think they've found it as hard as some of the other sectors. Yeah. Can I jump back, um, Brian, to something you mentioned sure. at the beginning of the call? You're talking about the kind of positive impacts of gamification on education. I'm interested mm -hmm. to hear, you know, what, what you've been doing there, and you know what lessons we can all take. Um, to, 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 uh, I suppose to take and understand your learning from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that that uh, you notice if you've been playing with your son, if you're playing with any kids, they really kind of switch into games, and there will be games that really capture their imagination and their attention. You know, my stepson has a huge range of knowledge about the Napoleonic Wars and uh, Wellington's campaign in the Spanish Peninsula, not because he's a massive history buff, but because he played the Total War series, um, mm -hmm. down to the point where he can identify different regiments by their uniforms. So gaming is a fantastic way of passing on knowledge. Um, and my own example, my son's three and a half, and we've been letting him play the Khan Academy Kids app. Mm -hmm. And it's an almost perfect example of gamification because you've got those intrinsic and extrinsic rewards you've got little collectibles you've got no you know um named characters that help them go and learn about you know the numbers and spelling and it's like pronunciation and colors problem solving and gamification applied gaming is phenomenally good at all of these things so i've been i've been working with a really broad range of companies out there mm -hmm just to try and help them understand what the heck this is because the old supposition that well you just let them do what they've always done but then at the end you give them a badge mm. isn't right wow. you know it really isn't um as a more recent example one of the companies up in uh, up in dundee Stormcloud, have just published a game with nat west or rbs as they used to be known um called saver island and it introduces kids to the whole concept of um, saving and, and financial planning and that kind of thing. Mm. And in a few weeks, it busts through a million downloads. And, you know, it, it's it's been doing fantastically good things because it's not patronising kids. It's not an educational game. Mm -hmm. It's a game. But it's because you're doing something else and as part of doing something else, you know, you're learning as you go. So it's that kind of that engagement. And, and this is the whole thing engagement with fun is what mm -hmm. we're talking about and yeah. that doesn't just have to be as part of education you know every app that you use whether it's your banking app your there's supermarket online ordering um they're all focused on functionality but very 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 few of them are focused on fun and fun doesn't have to mean you know ha ha it doesn't have to mean mm -hmm. barrel chested space marines and explosions it, you know just even little audio feedback even little tactile um, you know, uh, feedback to let you know that you've achieved something can be phenomenally strong and just making you feel that you are achieving something, that the, the app, the piece of software is responding to you. Um, and if you can build that in, you can build in something that's far more, you know, responsive to people and people will react far more strongly to it. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, totally, totally. There's a, there's a great question that's just popped in. It's just how to handle a client that wants, you know, wants to do gamification with something but does not understand how the games work and need to be shown um, how their ideas will not work as a game. Yeah, yeah. And this is the classic, you know, the, okay, this isn't working. We need to gamify it. It needs to be more fun. And um, they'll bring you in. They're not willing to make the fundamental changes. You know, so because as far as they're concerned, gamification means giving people a badge when they've done it. Um, let me give you an example. So it's uh, one of the Scandinavian countries. I think it's Norway. They've got a average speed area. So you've got speed cameras. And instead, if you go through the average speed camera, you exceed the average speed, you get fined. But the way they're doing it, and this is what I mean about incentivization, 
if you go through and don't exceed the speed limit, they'll capture your license plate as you would expect. But then one person from that particular week or month gets picked and they win all of the fines. Oh, wow, that's great, isn't it? Oh my instantly, God, oh, instantly we're slowing down. <laughs> yeah, talk about an incentive. You know, oh, oh, you know, work has dried up during COVID. I might go for a wee drive. I'll drive through this thing about five or six times just to see if I can, you know, maintain the speed limit. I might win. It might help me pay the rent. And um, that's what I mean about incentivization. It's thinking about things in a playful way. You know, you mentioned at the, the beginning, games have a bit of a, a bad rap and it's a particularly British thing. We have this, this, um, constant narrative which games equal toys therefore they're for kids so there is mm. no worth or merit in them that's why the industry was allowed to go in Dundee if people mm. had taken it seriously it would have been shipped out to Glasgow, Edinburgh or quite possibly yeah. London but because it's video games nobody really cares it was allowed to grow and flourish in Dundee you know there's no mm. other reason it would have been there it, you know Dundee is not a natural you know place for games to be but um we, we're starting to see, we're starting to learn, and this is where I think Scotland can get its pioneering status back again and actually start to really um, Talking of gamers, the my, my, my gamer <laughs> just, just nipped in to pick up a PlayStation controller. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Saying hi. Hello, nice everybody. to see you. <laughs> hey, buddy. We're this just talking for you. He, he, he designs and plans and works on computer games. Brian does. Oh, Is that true. cool? Oh, Brian is hey, asking what ones. Finn, well, I've not worked on Fortnite, but I did do Grand Theft Auto. But did you know that the, the guys Grand who make Auto. Fortnite have now got an office in Edinburgh? <laughs> did he? <laughs> yeah. He did, yeah. Epic <laughs> Games have got an office in Edinburgh now. So and Brian's stick, saying the guys that made... Tell your dad to be nice to me, oh, and we'll do a studio tour at some point. Not far from here. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll get Brian, you, and Finley on a private call for uh, an hour or so after this. Consider it done. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, so we've we've only got really kind of chat, time for one more chat a uh, uh, question, Brian. And I just wanted to ask you that you know at the moment there's an, uh, an immense need for leadership and mm -hmm. you know people have been pitching in and leading here there and, and everywhere and and we're we, we you know all of us in the call and myself and andrew in particular are so keen to be able to to use the skills and the attributes that we've got to offer some support and some help and and um very much deliver for the sector but who's inspired you right now over the last few months or even over the last few years who's caught your attention uh, do you mean in games specifically, or, or yeah, well, games maybe? in the wider society? Whoever, whoever you think. Mm -hmm. Um, that's that's a really good question. Uh, there are a few people out there who have really, you know, I guess picked up a lot of the the, the ideas we've been talking about today and really run with them. So one of the guys that um, I've always found truly inspirational was a guy called Elan Lee. So he's a game designer based out of the US and uh, he ran a, a, an experiential game studio. So they did an awful lot of um, alternate reality games. Um, if, if you go back to Christopher Nolan's um, uh, The Dark Knight, you know, the, the Batman series, they did a game, a, an alternate reality game called Why So Serious that pulled in thousands of people all over the US and all over the world and really sort of got them to explore that, that Batman universe in a completely different way. Um, Jane McGonigal, who's an academic in the US and um, who has been preaching the whole notion of games for good, um, she's done several books and a couple of projects that, that really show the potential for capturing that amount of the time and attention that people plow into games, but doing it in a way, doing it in a way which really makes a big, big difference. Um, and then I guess, looking beyond games because i think the, the potential here is is out with mere entertainment um some of the things that, that have been coming out of the the music sector i find particularly inspiring because from uh, an industry that was being beaten up and destroyed by technology there are people coming through now who have really really started to seize the means of production and really understood how technology can be used 
um, to empower themselves and to reach an audience. So as, as an artist, a practitioner, a musician, Amanda Palmer is a bit of a, a hero of mine because yeah, mine too. you know she told the record company to go to stick it. Um, started out on her own, she's using Patreon, she's using SoundCloud, she's using all the social channels, and she's reinvented what it means to be an artist in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Daniel Eck from, Sound, uh, from Spotify came out on record a couple of weeks back and said, releasing, you know, one piece of work every three to four years is no longer enough. And the music industry went crazy. Um, but it's a bit like shooting the messenger. You know, people were complaining, well, it's because you get such awful royalties from streaming. But content is no longer scarce. You know, that's the reality. Look around. You know, I would have gone and bought, you know, Metallica albums every four years when I was growing up. Now I'll kind of give, them, give it a listen. And if there's something I like, I might buy the individual track. Um, you know, the world is changing. The world is evolving. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think if you look at Miss Palmer and what she's done, mm -hmm. somebody who is surfing that zeitgeist, oh, God. You said it, buddy. Like that, you said it. Um, but somebody who's coping with the, the ever changing and ever evolving reality yeah. of the creative industries, um, you know, I personally think that, that she's she's doing you know doing it right, and there's a lot to be learned there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ryan, we're, we're kind of at time, but I, I want to ask one more question. So, uh, is that okay with Rachel and Keenan? You don't have to run <laughs> off and get your tea. Um, <laughs> You know, we, we're talking about the kind of um, Mike Brook, um, who's a friend of mine. Hey, Mike. Um, he has said that, you know, gamification to solve societal issues, you know, loves that idea. And uh, we were discussing it earlier, you know, you, in terms of the kind of, um, you know, um, I can't remember which country you mentioned, but, you know, giving a positive, you know, opportunity to win the fines back, you know. Um, now, I was in China earlier in the year, um, pre COVID, um, and I was in Shanghai. and spent the time on a sort of trade mission all around Shanghai, meeting lots of Chinese businesses and kind of getting, trying to get an understanding. And from my understanding, they already have gamified the kind of behavior of people within um, Shanghai and a lot of the Chinese cities in terms of, yeah. you know, if you if you don't put something in the, the bin, um, there's facial tracking everywhere. There's cameras literally everywhere you go and your point score goes down. And if yeah. you do something good, you know, your point score goes up. And if you get, if you get, if you get it, you know, if you go lose too many points, you suddenly cannot buy a house in a certain area. Or um, they, they also do things that then your face will appear in a cinema. Um, and, and these are all things that I've understood, you know, from talking to people there. And I'm just interested, I suppose it's, it's got the opportunity for good, but also, you know, there there can be a real, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've seen the Black Mirror episode um, that yeah. I'm sure it's all been based on. Um, and I, again, I'm just interested on your viewpoint because you're in that world and you'll have a real, you'll have deep thinking about it. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, one of the things that, that um, gamification offers is, is taking all of these tools, techniques and technologies out into your real life. And you're already seeing elements of this. You know, th there have been elements of gamification around and about for years. Your Tesco card, you know, your loyalty card is essentially gamifying your shopping experience. You're being rewarded for making decisions. Yeah. What yeah. Um, the Black Mirror episode, what Charlie Brooker, who's an ex-games journalist, by the way, I got him out up to Dundee mm -hmm. to come with new Grand Theft Auto. Um, he didn't like Dundee. Uh, who knew why? He still won't pick up the phone. So, <laughs> damn you, Charlie. But, um, you know, one of the, the, the reason it was so good is that he actually understands the implications of, of how technology can be used and then abused and takes it to extremes. Mm. So the social ranking thing that's being trialled in, in China um, is widely held up by, by human rights organisations as, as a massive abuse. Mm -hmm. But if you want to go back to sort of the the ways in which this can be beneficial and, and terrifying. There's a, an American game designer, a guy called Jesse Shell, S-C-H-E-L-L. -L. Back in 2010, he gave a, a talk at the Long Now Foundation called Visions of the Game Apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And it essentially outlined how all of these technologies, how all these business models, microtransactions, facial recognition, social channels, you know, the fact that you're sharing so much of yourself are all converging so that you're, uh, your mm. everyday life will become more and more tracked and monitored and can be rewarded or can be penalized. You know, it's these intrinsic, extrinsic um, incentives and penalties. Mm -hmm. um, and he was talking about this 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. All that's happening now is that we're seeing this, you know, coming into the mainstream. Uh, you know, I, I gave a talk at the Edinburgh Film Festival a couple of years back um, called uh, Game Apocalypse Now. 
mm-hmm. um, subtitled Why You Should Never Ever Trust Your Wi-Fi Toothbrush, which outlined how kids today could go through, you know, become influencers, how the in- Internet of Things mm-hmm. is so susceptible to hacking, and essentially outlining an entire new career and the downfall of some poor guy who got sponsored by, you know, um, Iron Brew. It, it was a long... I'll, I'll share this, the uh, presentation with you. Um, but, you know, all of these things are there to be used positively or negatively. Yeah. Um, and as long as there's ways for you to make informed decisions about how much of this you want in your life, then we should be reasonably okay. Yeah. But I, I mean, mean, I mean what thing, when, when, when I was sorry to interrupt, but when I, you know, when, when I was in China, I, I, I got to visit Alibaba, who are now the biggest mm-hmm. company or uh, in, in the world, and yeah. they, they showed their their new concept for a new supermarket. And um, within that supermarket and that ecosystem of controlling food, you were only able to pay using their own payment system. Yep. And then, you know, the same payment system was in part with the government and you could only use WeChat to then have conversation. And so you, yep. you have to have these applications on your phone mm-hmm. to be able to buy food. You know, and I, 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 I kind of see, you know, there's, there's a kind of worrying amount of control together there, isn't there, that kind of... Well, this is why, you know, the, the, the heads of Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and Apple were called in front of the, the US Congress a few days back. You know, it's, these decisions, these, these um, technologies are, are coming into existence and being widely adopted um, without any sort of oversight. You know, people are, are looking at, can we do something? Yes, rather than should we do something? Um, which is why we've had so much backlash against, you know, Facebook and its inability to police its co- own content, Twitter becoming a toxic cesspool, a toxic cesspool. Um, you know, Apple's dominance of its own ecosystem in terms of the 30% payment from every content and creator out there. Mm-hmm. You know, this is this is the world we live in. And you're absolutely right. This this can be terrifying if it's um in a, in a country, in a society where you have that level of control. Um, you know, my worry is that we're going to start sleepwalking into this here in, in Europe, the UK, because we're not making those decisions. You know, people are going to, oh, brilliant. Look, I can share pictures of my, my party at the weekend, not thinking that their boss is going to be able to see it. Future employers are going to be able to see it. You know, um, there's a positive side to this, which is all the soft skills that, that our children are learning in games can and should end up being on their CVs, you know, leadership, initiative, problem solving, you know, hand-eye coordination, all of these things can be done. So it can be positive. But again, it's not just gaming. You've got to look at this within the context of the rest of the tech sector. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's where you start to go either Utopia or, oh God, Blade Runner had it, you know, so, so badly wrong. That looks like a dream world now. (laughs) Well, great, Brian. You know, as usual, I could we, we could all sit and talk for the for the rest of the evening. Um, so, no, thank you so much for the insights um, that, that you've pleasure. shared with us. Um, I'd love to pick your brain some more. So, um, I'm sure we'll catch up um, at some point again um, if, if you if you'd have us. Um, I'd be thrilled. Thanks, Brian. Um, you know, for everyone that's joined us, thanks for joining us um, on this Tuesday evening. Um, we will be back again um, two weeks from now. Um, so make sure you turn on your notifications for Creative and Entrepreneurs Club or, and for Made Brave if you want to be notified of the next ones. Um, and if you want to catch up again on this session or on any previous ones, um, we'll be posting this um, on our LinkedIn pages and on um, our YouTube channel, Made Brave, and also on the Creative Entrepreneurs Club uh, website as well. So thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everybody. My pleasure, guys. Thank you very yeah. much. I'll catch you next time. Catch you next time.